Mine happened in 1963, when I was eight years old. I had become very ill with flu-like symptoms and could not hold down any food or fluids for almost a week. I remember my mother calling the small hometown doctor on the phone with concern in her voice, but he always assured her, without seeing me, that it was just the flu. I will never forget the burning sensation when I vomited only yellow bile, something I believe the doctor was not told. Then, as days passed and I became weaker, my vomiting quieted down. Both of my parents worked and they needed to get back to their jobs, so toward the final days of my sickness I was left alone during the daytime. On one of those afternoons, I was desperate for a drink of water. Somehow I peeled myself away from the couch and steadied myself before taking small steps to the kitchen sink. That glass of water tasted better than nectar, but as I turned back to the living room, my vision turned white, and I passed out. I woke later on the kitchen floor, and I have no idea how long I had been there. That evening I told my mother about the experience, and she looked very worried. The next day I suddenly felt better, and I even got up to play on the floor. I felt fine. But I was extremely pale, and my father insisted that I be taken to the doctor anyway. I'll never forget the look on the doctor's face when he put me on the examining table. One jab in my gut around the appendix told him all he needed to know. I remember the urgency in his voice as he told my mother to get me to the hospital immediately. My father's job had taken him out of town that morning and could not be contacted for several hours. My mother balked and the doctor insisted again that the situation was serious. He ordered an operation that very afternoon and I was taken to the hospital for admission. The nurses worked quickly as they took off my clothes and shaved my belly. Mom was in and out of the room as she made phone calls to people who could help her contact my father. The hometown doctor came into the room to see me before the operation and he introduced me to another doctor who was a surgeon. I didn't know it at the time, but the surgeon had driven 90 miles at high speed to help with the operation. The shaving was done. My mother told me not to worry, but she sounded scared, and I was wheeled into the operating room. Now I was scared and I started to cry. The nurses were a bit stern, which made it worse. I detected a funny smell and complained about it. They lied and told me it was the rubber on the wheels of my gurney. They were preparing to put me out with ether. Soon a mask with a screen was put over my face. Then the screen was covered with a towel, and the ether was poured onto the towel. I was told to breathe deeply like I was blowing into a balloon as I coughed and cried. Soon my head swirled around my body like an orbiting planet, and everything went black. It was soon after everything turned black when I realized that I could think and wonder about where I was. The best interpretation my childlike mind could decipher was that I was floating alone in the vast, dark universe. Soon I saw wisps of cloud-like creatures flying about with ease. They began to fly past me as they twirled me around. I became frightened, and they seemed to fly closer when they noticed my fear. I remember them taunting and giggling as they spun me around. I became so afraid that I cried out in fear and I asked for it to end. Something then changed as I noticed that I was floating upward and away from the wisps. Again I was alone in the universe as my fear subsided. Soon after I noticed I was floating upward to a large circular, cone-like formation that was dotted with sparkling stars. As I looked upward into it I could see it spinning, and the stars were more concentrated toward the smaller opening at the top. I floated upward as I gained momentum, and soon I was at the top of the spiral too, where I hit a sort of barrier like a bubble that has come to rest against something that has trapped it. I stayed there for a while and felt no need to move about. Then suddenly I felt something tugging on me from the other side of the barrier. I was grabbed by the arm and pulled through the barrier to the other side. I had been pulled through by a young man of about 25 years of age. He was very friendly and seemed surprised to see me. He didn't know who I was so he asked. I couldn't find my voice so I just stood there. Then a few other people came around to look at me. They were older people and very kind. They asked who I was and I said my first and last name, 
which made them ask more questions. They said we were related, but they wanted to know who my father was. I again said my name, and I told them my father's name. Then they seemed to gasp because they knew my father. The older people introduced themselves as my father's grandparents, and they were very gracious, very happy to meet me. The two grandmothers hugged me and made sure I understood that I was in a safe place because I was very confused as to what was happening. They introduced me to the young man who pulled me in. He was my father's cousin who died in the Korean War. As I spent more time in this place, I seemed to gain strength and I realized that it was warm and comfortable. We were all surrounded in a white light that was very pleasant. I also noticed that we all had a bluish glow about us. They showed me some high-backed chairs that they often would sit in. The chairs looked somewhat like thrones to me. They showed me a chair that would someday be my father's, and then they showed me a chair that they said could be mine if I would sit in it. I sat in it for a moment, but didn't want to get too settled in as I was curious and wanted to look around. Then they showed me generation upon generation of my father's family going back for hundreds of years, and each of the people they showed me was sitting in their chairs. They could be seen going back toward a more intense flight like steps of a ladder. The older generation people did not come forward to greet me, and I don't remember if they were able to acknowledge me. However, the more recent generations seemed to at least say hello. At some point during my visit with my father's grandparents, they told me to wait for a moment because a very special person was coming to greet me. The person they wanted me to meet was an older woman who glowed brighter than the others. She too showed an incredible amount of love and affection for me, but hers was much more intense. This indeed was a very special woman. I was totally enveloped by this woman's love and felt completely at ease much like an infant who has fallen asleep in the arms of their mother. She told me many things and I understood that the glowing light was the presence of God. She said that she was his messenger who was assigned to review my life. She had the ability to reach inside my mind and pull out the memories and events of my life, which we reviewed together like a flickering movie. She seemed pleased with what she saw until we came upon an event when I had been extremely angry with my older brother. We watched together as I walked behind and hit him over the head with a baseball bat. Steve cried real hard, and she explained that hurting another like that was never acceptable. I was totally ashamed as she moved on to the rest of the review. When the review was over, this special woman brought me back to my father's grandparents and said that it was time for me to make a decision. I could either stay there with them, or I could go back to finish my life. My two great-grandmothers tried to convince me to stay, and they encouraged me to sit in my chair again, which I did. But soon I was up and about again, because I felt unsettled. Then the special woman told me that if I decided to stay my mother on earth would be very sad. I told them that I loved my mother, and I didn't want her to be sad, so I wanted to return. One of my great-grandmothers protested and said that if I was sent back it could destroy me because life was so hard on earth. The special woman told her that my decision to return must be honored and I was brought back to the place where I had been pulled through. All of the relatives were talking at once and seemed real concerned for me. They instructed me to do my studies in school and to read my books, but at the same time they seemed to be telling me what my future would bring. I remember something said about writing a book and that I would be married and have a little girl. I also remember some ugly things, like many tanks rolling over sand dunes in a war. All of these things have come true to some degree. The young man who pulled me through in the first place was the same one who sent me back down. He told me to let myself slide and to relax. The trip back down was not as pleasant, and it happened quite quickly. The last sensation I remember was slipping back into my sick body and recalling what it felt like to be here. I immediately asked myself why I came back to such agony. Soon I opened my eyes and found my living grandmother holding my hand. I immediately told her that I was gone for a while and that I had met her mother who was very nice. 
She looked absolutely stunned as the other relatives in the room assured me that it was just a dream. I knew they were wrong, but I was too sick to argue.